Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie. I'm an alcoholic. You people live really far away from me. (laughs) Uh, But it is really good to be here. I brought two of my friends, and um, it was just nice nice to have them with me. Um, And i I, uh, got to calm down for a minute. We got lost. Um, Anyway, my sobriety day is June 19, 2005, and um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love being sober. And I never, ever in a million years thought I'd say that. And lucky for you, I don't have time to tell you my whole drunk log, so I won't. But I will tell you, I started drinking at a really early age, and um, and I loved it right from the start. And uh, it kind of, alcohol, like, defined who I was. I When I drank alcohol, I could play the guitar, I could play the piano, I could do lots, I could dance, I could play pool, I could do all kinds of stuff. And um, it made me feel like somebody in a world where, like, I really didn't know what I was about. And I remember long before to drink, oh, thank you. Oh, it's just what I needed. Like, as a kid in elementary school, I remember the teacher going around the class asking, um, you know, what's your favorite color? And really, honestly, deep, deep down inside me, I didn't know. I would pick, you know, hers, whatever yours was. Just... I, I just didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was about. Um, and when I started drinking, um, I became about all kinds of stuff, like the Grateful Dead. I started following them all over the place. And um, I became a NASCAR fan, and I became a football fan, and, all, and I became all, this, all these things that when I, when I finally did get sober, um, I found out that a lot of that stuff didn't interest me anymore. And I had a really hard time staying sober at the beginning um, or having a desire to be sober because I really didn't, I didn't think life could hold anything without alcohol. You know, it was definitely the force that drove me. So I drank for 27 years straight, and um, I did a lot of other stuff, too. And um, in my mid-30s, my brother and my brother and I were always drinking buddies. He's 11 months older than me, and him and I would drink all night, every night, play guitar and sing. We had a microphone hanging from the chandelier in the dining room, and we taped ourselves, and we thought we were awesome. And then um, he got sober. (laughs) <laughs> and he left me and I was devastated and the only other time I remember anyone ever getting sober it was my idol who was Stevie, Stevie Nicks um, growing up I had pictures of her all over my bedroom and I loved her and she snorted coke and she drank alcohol and she wrote these awesome songs and she had this great voice and I used to I remember even I would go in my basement and scream at the top of my lungs so I could make that's why I talk like this now so I could sound like her and um, I loved her, and I heard on the radio one day that she got sober, and I was like, what? Why? Why would she do that? She's so successful. And um, I was devastated that she would do something like that. And so that was my thoughts on getting sober, or why anyone. I couldn't understand why anyone would ever want to do that. And then my brother got sober on me, and my brother was an Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, he would come around, and he told me, that he was an alcoholic, and I mean, I was a mess of a drunk, a 24 around the clock drinker, and um, and I'm going, man, I'm sorry, do what you got to do, and I felt bad for him. Um, meanwhile, my life is like in shambles, you know, and he's doing this thing. There's this guy from Lancaster, PA, picking him up every single night, and and I thought that was awful weird. And I called my mom. I'm like, Rob's gay, dating that guy. And she's like, that's his sponsor. I'm like, what is his sponsor? Come on. Sponsor, sponsor. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it turned out that it was his sponsor. And he was doing steps. And, um, you know, what was going on with him was um, the look in his eye was changing. And the way my family was treating him was changing. And the way he reacted to stuff was changing. And it was freaking me out. And I stayed as far away from him as I possibly could. And every now and then he'd come around and try to 12-step me, I guess. And I'd be like, you know, you just don't know when to stop. Maybe you just could have a few. And he would just look at me. Like, well, you know, meanwhile, I'm three-quarters of the way through a case with a bottle of vodka on the side. And, and he just didn't know what to do with me. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I will say I took him back out a couple of times. But, but he um, definitely planted a seed. And shortly after that, I got in huge, huge trouble with the law. 
and I went to jail for the first time, and I had been doing some illegal stuff along with my drinking, and um, when I got to the county jail, I looked around, and I was like, oh, God. You know, I grew up in a good family. I was taught morals and values. I'm not really a lawbreaker. I was just hanging with the wrong crowd. This is a huge mistake. Let me out. I promise I'll never do it again. <laughs> and um, I swear. And and they let me out. They they put me in a program in um, drug court. And it would take me two years to graduate, but I did get a diploma. But in the meantime, like, I was failing the test, and I was not showing up for stuff, and I was you know, um, getting caught doing all kinds of stuff. And I, I didn't know I was powerless. And all around me, I'm going to meetings, and everyone, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, and I'm raising my hand saying, I'm Julie, I'm an alcoholic. But, like, deep down inside, I, I didn't think that. I thought maybe the, that, that some of that side stuff I was doing was definitely a problem. And um, But once I cleaned all that mess up, certainly you can't take my drink from me forever. Um, so I tried to continue to drink. And I, I went in and out of the county jail, seven times during that um, period, over that two years. And, you know, the second time I, I went in, I'm like, oh, my God, let me out. This time I really, really swear I'll never do it again. And then the third time and the fourth time. And then, you know, by the seventh time around, I'm like, this is home. Like, hey, sisters, you know, I'm back. And everyone knew who I was. <laughs> and um, I knew I knew how to get along in there. And, um, yeah, it sucked. It really sucked. Um, so, finally... Um, I, I just put down everything but the alcohol, and I was sneaking drinks now and then, but not real often, just just often enough to take the edge off. And I can stay sober for certain periods of time as long as I know I'm going to get some relief down the road. I can hang in there. So that's what I would do. And I was still going to meetings. I wasn't hearing a thing. I wasn't getting a sponsor. Um, if I did get a sponsor, I usually... Um, Oh, I just found all kinds of reasons that I had to go. I could never get with her, and I was late for a meeting, and I would leave early and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to drink. Now, when I when I stop doing really stupid, illegal stuff, my life does start to look a little bit better, and I'm, and, and I'm really snowballing these, these drug court people, and I'm hitting the meetings when I can. Most of the time, I'm just kind of my own slope, and, um, and I'm drinking as, on the weekends and, and as much as I can get it in. You know, and now I have to keep it in the cupboard and it's down in the basement where I iron. Ironing became my favorite thing to do. I was ironing, I was ironing towels and sheets and everything you could find. Just so I could go down there with my bottle of vodka. Yeah. Everything in my house was perfectly non wrinkled And, um, and I'm getting through the phases of the program and I got myself a real good job and things are looking really, really good. Um, <clears throat> Except when I drink, I, I'm not real bright. And I was out at a bar one night, and I'm drinking with this big old Greek guy who owns the place, and he likes me, and he's buying me drinks. And I'm like, I love Greek people. You Greek people are so beautiful. I know a Greek lady. She's my probation officer, but she's beautiful. I love her. And he's buying me drinks. And, I, and um, it's her dad. It's her dad. And I went to... I went, <laughs> I went to court that week, and, they, and I'm in my business suit because I'm putting on a show, and um, they put handcuffs on me and took me right off to jail. And then I was like, you know what? This is crazy. And I swore off the drink. And that's all I did. I swore off the drink. And I went for, I always say it was two years, um, but it really wasn't because here's what I was doing. Um, I'm sure I was sneaking drinks now and then, but I was telling everyone I was sober. But I was definitely... Um, got hooked some, for some reason on alpha seltzer plus cold medicine, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, and I'm guzzling it by the case. I don't know why. It didn't do anything for me, but I, some kind of mental obsession took over, and it got me through. And I was raiding people's medicine cabinets and helping them all kinds of pills, and, you know, eventually I was falling down drunk again. And, um, you know, my dad and my mom tried to help me so many times, and, you know, they would just give me that look like, why can't you just get it together? You got everything going for you. And, um, you know, they would bend over backwards to try to help me. Um, my father, I, I had this big sob story because I had a record now, a criminal record that I couldn't hold a job. So he was retiring from banking and he bought a little art gallery and he told me I could be the manager and he paid me really well and I sat up in this art gallery for a whole summer getting ready for a grand opening and, uh, all I did was drink the whole time all day long and I got paid to do it and they just sat back and, wa and were watching me die and towards the end of that summer it was coming up on the opening and I um, that's when 
I got to that spot where I couldn't imagine my life with a drink, and I couldn't imagine my life without a drink. And I was definitely at the bitter end. And I went crawling to them, and I said, oh, my God, I need some help. And they cried, and they hit their knees, and they thanked God. And they got me a bed in the Karen Foundation. And um, for the first time in my life, I, I really, really had a desire to not be doing what I was doing. And I had no idea what recovery was about, even though I had been exposed to AA and all the that whole thing, you know. Um, without, I had no idea that people were getting happy in AA. I had no idea. I saw my brother do it. He introduced me to a few people. My eyes started opening a little, and I thought there might be a little hope for me. Um, but when I left their house, I had to wait four days um, for a bed. And as I was driving down the driveway, I remember thinking, no, man, I can't believe I just did that. Maybe I can manage. And I tried to talk myself out of it. And the day before, I put all kinds of stuff in my body. And I hit my knees, and I said to God, if I wake up, I'll go. And if I don't, I'm okay with that, too. I just was done, you know. And I woke up. I woke up, and I was kind of upset when I woke up. And I said to my mother, my mother's outside beeping, and she's all happy, and she has clothes she bought at Kmart that were three sizes too big for me that I wore for 33 days. And um, she drove me the long way to Reading, and I looked over at her, and I'm like, and I heard this in me. I, I said, I don't know if I have another recovery in me. And she, like, spit coffee out her nose. And she looked over at me, and she's like, you never had any recovery in you, ever not one. <laughs> and, and she was right. Like, I, she was right. I had no steps. I had no God. I had none of that. None of that. And, um, and she was right, and it, and it made me angry. But I went there, and I listened, and I surrendered, you know, and I thought I did that that. 100% surrender. Like, I definitely knew I was an alcoholic. I knew it. And I, and I knew I was powerless. Um, but what happened there was I, um, I was given a little reprieve by this probation officer I had. I was on a county supervised state parole. Um, and that just means if you screw up, you go, you're going up to the big house, the big, big house, big girl jail, right? And so she was giving me one more chance and I was so blessed. I was like, oh my God, God is so good. And oh, I'm going to do this program. And I did my 33 days and I, gave this wonderful speech, you know, and I looked at my dad and my son and my mother, and everyone was so, yeah, she's going to do it. And I got home that day, and I had every intention, and they held off that opening of the art gallery so I could still have my job. And on the day before, I got home, and I called the sponsor, and she said, we're going to Park in Maryland for a meeting tonight, and I think it was a Monday night, and I'm like, that's kind of far away, and I think I'm going to work a little late. We're trying to get the gallery ready. Um, and she laughed, and she's like, well, how soon do you want to get better? And she's saying all this smart-ass stuff. And, <laughs> and I'm like, I'll get with you. I'll get with you. When are you going to be in York? <laughs> and I didn't go. And and I also called that probation officer to thank her for the second chance. And what I got when I called her was um, a, a message on her machine that said she was in an intensive training program and she wouldn't be available for three weeks. And like, and, and if I had an emergency to call a number, but I was to call it periodically. And then just that quick, and, and, and I'm so grateful for this experience. Um, I lost everything. And, but I nailed my step one. Because what I did after that, I hung the phone up and I picked it back up and I made a call that would change my life. And I went and drank. And I drank all that night and I missed that opening and I humiliated my family. And my son looked me square in the eye and he said, I hate you. I hate you, and I don't ever want to see you again. And I rolled in the next day to get a bag of clothes, and I called that sponsor. I'm like, I'm ready. I said, but I don't know why I'm doing it anymore. And she said, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. You're in a, and she was so happy that I was in this devastating spot. And I get it now. I really get it now, because you have to kind of be stripped down. I had to be stripped down to nothing to be even the slightest bit open-minded to do anything. And, I, and at this point now, I was willing and the only reason, I like, I really thought that there would be no more. Mom and Dad weren't, weren't coming back yet again. My son, he meant it. You know, it's over. And and I was okay with that. I was like, I mean, I wasn't okay with it, but I was just like that. I just wanted to be sober more than anything. And I wasn't doing it for him. And I wasn't doing it for them. And, and that made a difference. And so she picked me up, and I went with her everywhere. I went with her to Jersey, Philly, Guam. You name it. We were going to meetings everywhere, and I didn't care. When she said, we're going, we're going, I got in, we went. And she took me through the steps. And um, it blew my mind. Um, you know, I, I had an awesome fourth and fifth step experience 
with her. I never, I never knew that I never trusted anybody, but I, I never did. Um, and all the people, all the years that I, I was given a lot of help. I had therapists and counselors and doctors, lawyers, all the, you know, all kinds of people that all they want me to do is be honest with them so they can help me. And I can't be honest with them. I can't. And I don't know what the reason is. I um, mean, it's because they're reporting to my judge or the children and youth services or what, for whatever reason, um, I had to put on some kind of show like I'm better than I am. I'm doing better on the inside. So I would never get any help. Um, but this time I was absolutely desperate and I sat across the table from another alcoholic. And who would have thought that, that she would open up that door and, and make me feel part of this thing? I, after my fifth step is when I really started feeling connected in AA and connected to women in AA. And I knew um, she talked about how when she got here, she felt like scum of the earth. And that's really, that's how I felt. Um, I had done some things in my life that I was just not proud of. And um, I just never knew how you could ever get over that, you know. I would cringe, ooh, that cringe thing when you have a little flash, ooh, could I do? And I don't do that anymore. Like, that all got lifted. And um, my, my obsession to drink got removed somewhere after my fifth step. And I called her up, and I'm like, I can't even believe it. Like, I can't remember the last time I thought about having a drink. And she said, don't take that for granted. That, that You know, that's a daily reprieve based on your... And she started telling me all this little stuff. Like, God is everything or is nothing. And you have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of your spiritual condition. And um, <clears throat> what she saw... And, and I went through all the steps. And I had a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, my life was full of joy. I was started sponsoring other girls. Um, and I noticed a boy across the way at the Philly Axe Recovery, and he was, like, very, very young. Not too young. He was legal and so. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you how young he was. I knew I was in a sick relationship when I looked out the kitchen window. My, my son was coming around every now and then, and him and my son were out there skateboarding together. I'm like, <laughs> he might be a little young. <laughs> but anyway, um, my sponsor knew that, like, this was definitely distracting me from God and what I was trying to do, and, and that God wasn't, like, the first thing I was seeking at that time. I didn't know what I was blind to be. And she kept saying, she was highlighting things in my big book, like the God is everything or he's nothing, and she asked me to go back to my bedroom and hit my knees and um, ask God to remove anything blocking me from him. And I'm like, that's a trick, isn't it? It's a trick. Yeah, because I, and I was afraid. I wouldn't say that prayer because I knew. But then, you know, she and she's telling me God is everything or he's nothing. And it didn't dawn on me at the time that, like, I wasn't inviting God into that part of my life. I was praying about everything else, and I was kidding myself because I was still in my car with women and going to all kinds of meetings and speaking here and sponsoring this one. And I was doing all this stuff, and I was praying. But, like, my main, my focus wasn't there. It was on where's this dude at when I'm done, you know. And um, what happened was, you know, she started sharing concerns with me about that I might drink again. And I'm like, my obsession to drink was removed. Like, I haven't thought about a drink in forever. And she's like, you know, you might want to watch yourself. And um, I didn't know I was going to drink that day that I did, and I didn't plan it, and it wasn't premeditated. There was alcohol there, and I reached for it, and down the hatch it went. And I went out. I went out for two months. Two months of the worst hell I've been in in my 27 years of drinking. It was horrible. I wound up out in Mount Joy, living in the basement of people I didn't even know, with this crazy guy, and we were beating each other up every day, and it was just horrible. And um, I kept thinking about my friends back in AA, and how God was like, God was kind of like knocking on my door, and I was just kind of like, kind of running away, just kind of, I don't know, it was, it was weird, I felt like I couldn't make that, all I had to do was make one phone call, and they would have came and got me, and brought me back with open arms, and for some reason I just couldn't do it, and um, I violated my county supervised state parole, and um, they sent me a notice that I'd be going one to two, and I... I was like, wow, you know, and I thought about my son who I left back in New York, just like nothing, and I thought about how this drink had taken control of my life again, and I, I didn't want it, I wanted AA, I wanted God back, I wanted AA back, and I rolled back to York with nothing in my pocket, my mother got me a hotel room because she didn't want me anywhere near her house, and she said, stay away from your son, you're not going to hurt him again, and now they know AA doesn't work, because there I went through the steps, and made some amends, and um, they're like, then they were done with me uh, again. And uh, I came back to York, and I had a, I got in a little hotel room for a couple of days, 
and I put the bottle down in the corner, and I hit my knees. I called my sponsor, Patty, and I and I I said, I just want to come back. And I said, but I think I'm going upstate. And she's like, that's fabulous. You have no idea how many sick and suffering people are up there. And you go up there and share your experience, strength, and hope, and, and God will use you. And, and, and there's, you know, there's I'm like, oh, hey, all right, that's good. <laughs> Easy for you to say, you know. But so I did, and, and I hit my knees, and I asked God to remove it. And I had, by the grace of God, I haven't had a drink since. And that was five years ago. But um, I put the bottle down, and my obsession was removed just like that. And I got some peace in my heart just like that. And I was facing all this crazy stuff. And, and I knew, and this is so valuable to me, too, because not only did I nail the step one again, I nailed the, the step two and the step three. And I really had no ability. If I wanted to put my hands in my life, I couldn't. I literally couldn't. And I'm so grateful for every minute of it. Um, because I got to witness God work in my life without my active participation and manipulation and all that other stuff I do. Um, and I just sit back, I sat back and I, and I let God take care of everything and He did. Um, I went up, I went upstate and, um, I was, I had a big book, I had a big book with me and, um, I drove a lot of people nuts, um, and I tried to help some people. I got there and there wasn't a whole lot of AA. There was AA that came in, um, came in once a week, but our unit could only go down once a month because they had to rotate. And I, I, a CO overheard me one day going, why aren't there any AA meetings on the unit? And she goes, well, yeah, there used to be. They, they reserved Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights at 7 p.m., but there was a lack of interest and it went away. And now they play cards and spades and watch TV. And I said, well, what if I got a couple girls together? Could we do that? She said, absolutely. So I got a couple of girls together and we did that. And um, at first it wasn't pretty at all because um, these girls didn't take too kindly to us taking their space. You know, they weren't allowed out there unless they were coming to the meeting. And they would stand around the outskirts and, and do, like, you know, the hairy eyeball. And we were getting my, and it was scary. And, and we were like, what are we going to do? You know, like, trust God. Trust God. Just share your experience. Let's just, you know. And that's what we did. And I got to witness the fellowship grow up around us. Um, there was four of us, four or five of us. And then little by little, you know, you'd see the girl kind of lend in the mirror. She'd listen a little or she'd pull up a chair way around the outside. And then little by little, they'd come in. And um, I did a one to two, but I actually, they screwed up my parole. And I was up there for 15 months. And um, by the time I rolled out of there, there was 50 to 70 women in that room, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night. And people wow. were sharing anniversaries. People were sponsoring people. Like, it was really, really cool. And, like, just to watch God do that, create that fellowship was neat. And when I left there, um, I went to a 45-day rehab, which was really, really fun, because they were concentrating a lot on behavior modification, which, like, I can't do that. If I can control how I behave or how I think, like, I'd be all right, you know? Um, and I'm going, don't listen to any of that crap. Trust God. <laughs> and these counselors are like, get this one out of here. Get this one out of here. She, you know? Um, they were very clinical, and there's a lot to that. I'm not, I'm not down on that whatsoever, but, you know, my, my solution is definitely in God. Um, and if I have outside problems, I see it's outside house. That's all. Um, so, I came home, I came out of there, and I didn't get that gut wrenching feeling like when I heard the gates of the county open every time. I'd be like, oh yeah, Bible study, AA book, I'm gonna stay sober, you know? And everyone's like, yeah, right, you're gonna stay sober. See you in a couple months. And, um, and I would leave there thinking, oh, I'm going to stay sober. And, and like, the minute I heard those gates squeaking, the stomach would start turning and the blood would start flowing and my heart would start pounding and I would have to run for a drink. Just powerless. Um, but this time I left there and um, I walked through them gates and, man, I had no fear at all. No fear. My fear was removed. Um, I came home. I went to a recovery house. Now I'm, like, 40 years old. And I'm living in a recovery house. I have a minimum wage job. I'm riding the bus. And it was the most awesome, awesome time of my life. I went through the steps again with my sponsor. Um, I, <clears throat> I I just had a blast. I had an absolute blast. After a while, I moved in with my sponsor. Um, then I moved back in with my parents for a while, which was very interesting at 40 years old. But they loved me. My dad and I read the paper together every morning. You know, God restored all those relationships that said, we are so done with you. You're finished. AA doesn't work. Like, it just seems so monumental. Like, how could I ever prove to them, like, I'm a different person? And God's like, you don't have to prove to nothing, though, these people. Like, God just opens eyes and, and 
changes hearts and you know, all I had to do was sit back, do these steps, take the action, and everything else around me just kind of fell into place, you know. And I, I did a lot of hard work on my nine step amends, and I still do it to this day. When I went away, I thought, you know, life is kind of over. You know, I'll never get married. My son's an attorney teen, graduate high school, go out to college. So those last few years of being a mom in the house with my son are over. And I and I let go of that. And I thought, you know, I don't know what you're going to do with that job, but whatever, I'm okay with it, you know. And um, my father, I never thought my father would ever speak to me again. And, and throughout this process, like, God has restored every single relationship that I have. Um, my son lives in my house with me and my husband. Um, he, he, did, he did graduate high school, and he did go off to college. And um, he, it, our whole relationship changed, and, and he trusts me. And he knows when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And he can count on me. And he called, he was calling me 12 times a day, telling me every thought that runs through his head, which is really scary. Um, <laughs> but I got to be a mom, you know. I got to be a mom. He got a DUI. And um, it was really neat because my husband, my husband's 13 years sober. And he got a DUI. And he was scared to death. And, you know, we talked about, you might, you know, you, you think you're an alcoholic, you know, we have this great solution. And he's like, nah, I don't want to do an ARD. And we're like, okay. So we take him in front of the judge, and he's terrified. And Ray and I are standing there. And all these people around us are like, we're like, look at him. Look at him, Ray, up in front of the judge. <laughs> Get the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was, it was wild. But, you know, he went down, he went down to the university, and he tore it up. And he partied a lot, and he, and he got kind of in deep, and he, he kind of got dead spiritually, and he went to rehab. And it was really cool, and he came back to York, and he went to recovery house for three whole days. And um, and I and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. More than I could ever dream of, my son will be an AA. You know, I wanted to pick him a sponsor, and I just tried so hard to control that, but yet stay back. And he was an AA for, I don't know how long it was, a couple weeks, three or four weeks maybe. Um, and he resigned one night, halfway through a meeting, he texted me. He said, I'm, he was resigning from AA, but he wants to go back to college. And so, um, he did. He went back. But he's back home now, and, um, he's with us, and, and he's not an AA, but that's okay. What's cool is, like, the seed was planted, and, and he sees how my husband and I live. Um, I work for my father. I actually went back to that gallery and got to manage it, and I got to hire a lady from, from Alcoholics Anonymous to be a curator. And, we had a really fun couple of years. Um, we just handed it over to an association in town, so I don't do it anymore. But who would ever thought that, you know? Standing them up when the mayor's coming to cut a ribbon and, you know, going to do my thing and humiliating him. And, and he lets me back in there. That's God. And, and I work for his other company now, and I'm, I'm getting ready to um, resign from there and, and go to work for myself, which is God-given too, which is really, really awesome. Um, but, but God has absolutely restored all my relationships. Um, now I swore off the men, and I'll just share this with you quick. I did. I came out from a girl, I'm like, get back, back off, you know. And, um, and I was, and I was like that, and I held firm for a really long time, and I hung with the women, and, you know, I decided that, um, you know, it seems like whenever I let go of my idea, what I think it is God should give me, that, that those things just come. Like when I, when I'm seeking, like all that, the way I think it should be, like, it's, 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 I end up with my own mess. So I'm not looking for a man in my life. And um, one of the girls comes up to me, she says, I know that I want to ask Jeff for coffee. I'm like, hell no, not doing it. That made me drink before, not going there, not about that. And um, about four days later, I'm like, okay, so who is it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she told me who it was, and I'm like, no, no, not, no, I don't, don't want to do that. And it's not who I would have picked, which is really, really cool, you know. So he asked me out for coffee, and I said yes. And we went out for coffee. We went out for coffee. We talked for a couple of hours, and he dropped me off. And we did that for three months, like one, twice a week we went out for coffee. And I dated this guy. Like, I never dated anybody. We didn't kiss. We didn't hold hands. We did nothing. We became really, really good friends. And um, he wasn't seeing anyone else, and I wasn't seeing anyone else. And slowly this, this matured, this love matured. And we, we dated for a year, and then he asked me to marry him. And I said yes. And he went to therapy right away. <laughs> yeah. He went and he called his counselor. Because every time I'd be like, so do you want to set a date? And he's like, his stomach would hurt. You know? Literally, he would like 
talk them over. And I'm like, you don't want to marry me, do you? And they're like, the old me would be like, why? What I do? Who is she? Why can't? Why? What's going on? You know, but I was like, let go, let God. I called my sponsor. What am I supposed to do? She's like, leave him alone. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm like, well, don't you think I should ask him what's going on? No, you shouldn't ask him what's going on. Well, don't you think I should ask my PC and someone else? No, it's not your business. Just leave him alone. Let God decide. So I did. I left him alone. And he came back around, and we got married. And we had a wonderful wedding. Um, my friend Jeff sang at my wedding, and she's got a beautiful voice. And um, my biggest fear, and these are old ideas, was that um, if you have a wedding reception, you must have alcohol at it. Not for me. You know, I've been sober for a few years. Um, but my parents drink. They're not alcoholic. My sisters drink. Their husbands are questionable, but how could they possibly have fun without alcohol? Like, here I am taking care of the alcohol people, which, you know, I spend more time thinking about drinking than they do. So I'm convinced that, that no reception can be fun without alcohol. So I told my mom, don't you think we should have, like, a cash bar? She's like, hell no. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and then you have half of your gay coming to your wedding. Just relax, you know. My husband's like, relax. It's going to be all right. like, ha. How is anyone going to dance? He's like, well, how are you going to dance? I'm like, I don't know. And I'm getting all wigged out about it, you know. So we don't have any alcohol at the wedding. And it turns out to be like the funnest wedding ever that I've ever been to. And I've been some trash at some weddings, let me tell you. Um, there was dancing all night. And the, the DJ even made a comment. He was like, wow, I really didn't think this would be so happening with no alcohol in here. Um, but, but it was. And they mistakenly poured three tables of um, Oski Spumante. And my mother just about tackled a waitress, and I hear this yelling. Like, do you have any idea what you're doing? And then my trooper sisters and their husbands, like, quit, grab them, and chug them all down. And that is what I would do. Like, I can respect that, you know. Go for it. If you can do that, do that. Anyway, my life has, like, totally come full circle. And, um, you know, it steps. They, it just, as a result of doing the steps, the psychic change necessary to recover from alcoholism. Thanks for waiting on me. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.